partners, No Cold War, Pivot to Peace, Show Up America, and World Beyond War. This coalition continues to grow and we're happy that you were able to join us today. And this weekend, many of our community joined over a thousand people in the streets of Oakland, um, masked up and safe to rise for peace in response to the violence against the Chinese population there. It was a beautiful gathering and yet antagonism towards China continues out of the White House. The first casualty of this US war on China is violence against Asians in the United States. Another casualty is the truth. And, you know, we have our action uh, towards PBS that you can join. Um, Angela will post it in the chat, but PBS is censoring a film that they funded about how China took its people out of extreme poverty by award-winning director, Peter Goetzels and it's being censored. Um, it was not censored or affected by any way by the Chinese government. So we hope you can act on that one. Um, we really wanna raise that up because it's so crazy. And as people have been able to watch the film, um, our last interview was with Peter and he's made it available. You see that it's, it's the most straightforward educational film, what a documentary should be that he went in with a question, wow, how did they do this? How do you take people out of poverty? And he got answers. Maybe they're not answers that people like, maybe they don't make you feel good, but he got real answers that, you know, wow, somebody did this and this is how it has to happen. And it was not, and now we're kind of impoverished by the information if we live in the United States. So hope you'll act on that one. So, you know, we continue to find as we talk to activists and our organizers in the streets that there's a lot of confusion about China. And so I reached out to my brilliant friend who I have often been in the streets with against war, Chris Hedges, to join us today to talk about propaganda that leads us to war. Chris is a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, a Presbyterian minister, a journalist, an author, a television host. He's written many, many books on the state of the world, but my two favorite are War is a Force that Gives Us Meaning and What Every Person Should Know About War. These he wrote after nearly two decades as a foreign correspondent in Central America, the Middle East, Africa, and the Balkans. He's seen war up close and very personal. Welcome, Chris. Thank you for joining. Thanks, Thanks Jody. So can we start by talking about, you know, what you've seen around the U.S. war on China and your concerns? Just you know, Well, <clears throat> we do have an enemy, uh, but to quote Karl Leibniz, it's the enemy within. It's the military industrial complex that has no restraint, no control, no regulation. Uh, it used to be that under the old Democratic Party, they would at least challenge certain weapons systems. They do not anymore. Uh, they, in fact, under Trump, got more money than they even asked for. And <clears throat> any society that allows a military to grow that powerful economically and politically uh, inevitably uh, lurches towards catastrophe. And go read uh, Barbara Tuckman's uh, The Proud Tower uh, on the uh, start of World War I where uh, in particular it was German militarism in particular uh, uh, led by the Kaiser uh, uh, that just uh, precipitated a war that should have never been fought and ended up in a suicidal folly uh, for France, uh, Britain uh, uh, and Germany itself. Um, so why is a, an out of control military so dangerous? If you come out of the military culture. You are historically, culturally, and usually linguistically illiterate. You uh, believe in the myth of uh, whatever civilization, whether it's uh, German chauvinism in World War I or American exceptionalism. Uh, and that chauvinism, that sense of exceptionalism, uh, the flip side of that is racism. Uh, it's about the denigration of the other, uh, I just actually reread uh, Edward Said's Orientalism, which is precisely about that. It, it, is, it is about, in order to create the mythology of whiteness, uh, 
Du Bois uh, writes about this, Baldwin writes about this, which is also, of course, a myth. Uh, you, 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 you take a racial characteristic and you endow it with uh, all sorts of virtues. It, it, these are completely fictitious. Uh, and, that, and then you set these virtues against the other. This is very much part of the military culture because in order to kill, uh, you must dehumanize. You must look at the other not as somebody who has your capacity for empathy, who uh, you, you turn them into an object. Um, and so the military culture is one that is uh, designed to speak exclusively in the language of force. You, you don't communicate any other way. Uh, you communicate through violence. And uh, because there's been no control and because we've eviscerated our diplomatic institutions, and when I, even when I was overseas, 40% uh, of the embassy was uh, military intelligence. And half the time the ambassador didn't know what the CIA station chief was doing. Um, go back and read um, Stephen Kinzer uh, or uh, The Devil's Chessboard by uh, David Talbot. Uh, to see, you know, what these intelligence service, what this uh, military uh, kind of intelligence industrial complex is about. Uh, it, it is uh, uh, one that has, not, not just now, but through ever since World War II, engaged in uh, torture, <clears throat> extraordinary rendition, kidnapping. This happened under Dulles, Alan Dulles, uh, immediately in the immediate aftermath of uh, World War II. Uh, it, uh, it's not an intelligence gathering service as such. It seeks to overthrow governments, uh, Arbenz in, Guata in Guatemala or uh, Mossadegh in Iran, uh, Pinochet in Chile, et cetera, et cetera. So what we have uh, kind of been asleep at the switch on is this uh, military uh, complex with tremendous resources has created a ring around China, the same way they have with Russia. Uh, uh, imagine if we had, uh, you know, the Chinese fleet off the coast of California, or if we had uh, nuclear missiles uh, stationed, uh, you know, within close proximity of the border of the United States. And if you look at the map, uh, John Pilger did a pretty good film on this a few years ago, uh, called the coming war with China. But if you just look at the map, uh, whether it's Okinawa or outside of uh, Australia or the Marshall Islands, uh, China is completely ringed. And what they have done is create a kind of giant rat trap so that if there was a war, they can uh, shut down the, the shipping lanes uh, and uh, of course have uh, a nuclear capacity to obliterate uh, China. But let's be clear, though. I mean, any nuclear war is not going to just obliterate China. It's going to obliterate all of us. Uh, most uh, scientists say that it would create a kind of massive uh, kind of black cloud that would uh, the entire earth would be covered in ice for one or two years. I mean, it's the end of human existence and, and, and the existence of most other life forms. Not that, of course, we're slowly getting there, not even slowly anymore through climate change. Um, but, you know, societies that can't control their military live deeply to regret it. Uh, and so that ethos, that dehumanization, that celebration of fictitious virtues of the white race or whatever imperial race it is, your blessing, uh, which is usually white, uh, is uh, one by the lens by which they look at the entire world. So they don't actually know anything about China. Uh, the, you know, nationalists always look at other uh, people uh, and see themselves. They see their own lust for violence. They see their own prejudices. I mean, you know, I had famous kind of battles with Christopher Hitchens uh, and uh, Sam Harris after 9-11 uh, over these same issues. So, I mean, here you, I, I spent seven years in the Middle East. I was the Middle East bureau chief for the New York Times. I'm an Arabic speaker. These people don't know anything about the Middle East. They don't, but they don't believe they need to know anything about the Middle East. They don't, and this is what's happening with China. Also Russia, I mean, we talk, the, the difference is China's a harder target because there's so much manufacturing in China. That doesn't mean that, you know, we won't, the, the military, which has no restraints, uh, we won't be led into 
a conflict, which I pray to God won't happen, um, Russia's an easier target. I mean, militarily compared to the United States, uh, you know, Russia is the Alabama National Guard. I mean, Russia just, just didn't even have a military of any potency. Um, but the United States encroachment on China is, parallels the encroachment on Russia. I mean, the whole Crimea issue is really centered around the fact that the United States wanted to establish a base, a naval base in the Crimea and control the Black Sea. With things we would never permit to happen in our own geographical proximity. So um, the, the, the fact that the military is so awash in funding and is so unaccountable and uh, because of the nature of the military itself, uh, the United States military has become an, a phenomenally dangerous entity, not only to global world peace, but to American democracy itself. And the Biden administration isn't going to it, it take on, the, at this point, the, the defense contractors. I mean, look, we have 20 years in the Middle East of endless war, which have been a complete catastrophe, uh, certainly uh, first and foremost to the people in Iraq and Afghanistan and Syria and Libya and everywhere else. Uh, but it's just been an utter failure. I mean, it is, uh, it, it, and yet nobody's held accountable. The, the, oh, the generals all get promoted, and then when they retire, they all go to Raytheon, and and then uh, after uh, a new administration, they go from Raytheon back to the Defense Department. It's utterly incestuous. Uh, every uh, cruise missile, I believe, costs about a million dollars. So, so you know, let's drop how many cruise missiles did we drop on Libya? Quite a few. And then they make more. Uh, I mean, that's uh, there's no there's no rationale to continue these uh, conflicts except that war is a business. Uh, they, they make a lot of money. Um, so yes, I, I think you're you're right, to, and I worry about it because you don't want foreign policy left in the hands of of generals, and uh, because they will, they will do what they're trained to do, and that is uh, inch you closer and closer to a conflict, even if that conflict is suicidal. Yes, thank you. That was awesome, um, because it's so hard to do this work when you're looking at, I call it barbarism of, um, of, of the military. And we pretend to be civilized. But when you think about a drone strike in the middle of Pakistan, killing you know hundreds of innocent people, that's barbarianism. I mean, yeah. but, and we say that's the word that we use to describe them. Uh, but when we were in Pakistan and met with some of the drone victims, um, they said, uh, we said, um, uh, if you had a drone, what would you do? And you could fly it over the United States. And they said nothing because it would kill innocent people. But we don't see people as innocent. We just see them as transactional needs to our greed. So, you know, there's this problem. <laughs> it's like my, my last question to you is why do people believe these lies that drive us to war, even in the face of losing the Korean War, losing the Vietnam War, and losing, you know, five trillion dollars and how many lives in in your lifetime in, you know, the Middle East? Why would we? Um, why would believe more lies? Because it's self celebration. I mean, if you look at 9/11, it was a celebration of us. Uh, and our power, and especially in given the breakdown and decay within American society, suddenly you're all united. It's a kind of false camaraderie, uh, but you're all uh, one in this great uh, battle. So uh, when I was uh, very vocal about my, uh, my calls not to support the invasion of Iraq, uh, I would come into the New York Times and the phone messaging system on my phone would just be filled with death threats and hate messages until they'd run out of space. And why? It, it's because I was challenging uh, 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 self-identification. I was challenging uh, that whole existential notion of us as a virtuous, great, powerful people that a lot of alienated 
people who had been discarded by capitalism needed uh, and, and imbibed it, to give themselves a kind of sense worth and a sense of belonging. So that's why, and it always works. Uh, and it, you know, it's, uh, there's a good book by Samuel Hines, who was a Marine Corps pilot in uh, the South Pacific in World War II, and then went on to teach literature at Princeton. He was actually my neighbor uh, just down the street. We lost him a little while ago, uh, called A Soldier's Tale. And it talks about that trajectory. Uh, of course, I mean, war is always about betrayal, betrayal of the young by the old, betrayal of uh, soldiers by politicians. Um, uh, but it works and it works, uh, especially for people who are disenfranchised. My own family comes from Maine, lower working class. They're all, they were all in the military, all of them, uh, including my grandfather and uh, my uncle who fought in the South Pacific and was destroyed by the war. Uh, but every generation, especially when you come out and, and we have to remember that the military because there's no draft, uh, these ki middle class kids, upper middle class kids, they don't go into the military. I mean, these, these elite schools, uh, Princeton's down the street, I've taught at Princeton, they're not going into the military. Uh, and and I, I will get out to some of these community colleges that I speak to, I was at, at in Northern Minnesota, uh, I forget the name of it, Manitoba State or something, but the professors were telling me that the uh, military has the ability to come in and get the transcripts of the students and they know who's gonna flunk out in real time and they show up at their door. And of course, in that area, there's a lot of indigenous, a lot of native Americans and uh, they're sucked right into the military machine. Um, so uh, you, you, what you're by, the reason it works is because it's a self exaltation, very sick self exaltation by the society. And it is effective, particularly with those people who feel alienated and vulnerable within that society, and they will react to you with a kind of violence when you challenge that, because for many of them at that moment, that's kind of all they have. Whoa, so also, um, you know, we, we just watched what happened on January 6th and you've, you talk about the, you know, the wars inside. I mean, that's fueled by the military because a lot of, you look at the leaders and a lot of people were there, that's, those are people that have been to war. Yeah, well, you go to war, you get damaged, all of us. I can carry a gun, but I got damaged like anybody who spent a lot of time around that industrial violence for prolonged periods of time. Um, yeah, of course. I mean, there a lot of those people are damaged. I teach in a prison. How many prison guards, most of them, a huge percentage of the prison corrections officers were in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, and of course, it's a great job if you come back filled with PTSD and a lust for sadism. Uh, it's, you'll probably get promoted. Uh, same thing with law enforcement. Uh, so uh, yeah, you, you are creating a, a damaged underclass that gets sucked into uh, the, those positions, whether it's the police or the prison system where they do the dirty work for uh, empire uh, internally. So yes, you're right. There were a lot of those people were vets. I mean, it was fascinating, especially watching the, the, when they breached, when they all lined up and they were wearing Kevlar uh, equipment, uh, and it, they clearly had been trained. They knew exactly what they were doing. Uh, and that is, so because when they come back, of course, they're thrown right back into the same, uh, you know, they're, 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 despite all the rhetoric, uh, and this has always been true with war. I mean, so they go right back into these uh, decayed communities where there are no real jobs. Uh, that's why the suicide rates are so high. Um, and uh, you know that that again is a factor of all war. Kipling wrote it. You know, in, it's Johnny this and Johnny that, and uh, throw him out the brute, but it's savior of your country when the guns begin to shoot. So uh, you know, there's an existential crisis, especially if you're a combat soldier, because if you go overseas, you understand uh, if you experience combat, all the lies that are told to you by the state, by the church, by educational systems and everything else about war and patriotism, you can only bond with your own. Um, and there's a, you know, we saw this after Vietnam uh, and there is a legitimate kind of rage. You've suffered trauma. Uh, and yes, I think that on the two things that I saw on the sixth were one, 
uh, you're very right that there clearly was a significant number of people who had been uh, within the military, but also, of course, the connecting tissue with all of these groups was Christian fascism, which I've written a lot about. So what about the propaganda that drives the electorate to the war that makes war okay or makes all this money that goes to military okay? I mean, for, for me, you know, why did I start China's not our enemy is all of a sudden I was like, this feels like pre-Iraq all over again. There's all these lies, they're proliferating. I see them everywhere. They don't make sense. Um, you know, it's like, why would somebody say that? It doesn't even make sense or this person's never been to China or it's trying to pull the heartstring around human rights, but it's not about human rights. If you cared about human rights, you wouldn't let Palestinians, you wouldn't fund Israel to imprison Palestinians or you wouldn't be letting Saudi Arabia bomb Yemeni. I mean, I care about human rights. <laughs> I know what that looks like. And if you're driving to war, the first casualty of war is human rights. So this doesn't even make sense, but you're watching a proliferation of lies. And then, then you're watching lies about COVID. Well, we had a pandemic that started in the United States that killed more people than, than COVID has killed. Or, you know, it's just, it's pulling at really loose straws <laughs> to try to tie a bow around war. And, and so, and now I just keep watching the propaganda and then people don't know what to do. It reminds me a little bit about being in um, Brazil when Bolsonaro was running and I saw the ads on, on WhatsApp and I, I felt my brain flip like it couldn't vote for the other guy because you don't know, you, you reach this doubt place. And I feel like, you know, is that what it does is it puts us in doubt and therefore it puts us in fear. And therefore we're gonna say, okay, more another trillion dollars to make more nuclear weapons because we have to fight China. Well, fill, one, it fills an emotional void. So in that it's effect, it doesn't have to make sense. Of course it doesn't make sense. You know, it's always irrational, but um, we don't live in a Cartesian world unless you're Noam Chomsky, um, who I love. I'm not in any way slamming Noam, he's our greatest intellectual. Um, so, uh, uh, that's number one. And number two, you're right. Fear, fear is the key. Um, and, uh, any despotic society we live in one has to use fear to keep, uh, the populace in check. So after 9-11, you know, Muslim, uh, quote unquote terrorists were about to blow us all up in our Walmarts. It was code orange or code, who knows, code pink. I don't know. It was some kind of code. They were the <laughs> but it didn't happen. I mean, it didn't happen. Uh, and then remember, they were supposed to storm all the state capitals and everybody. So it's just, you know, that it, it's a perpetuation of fear because it justifies. Uh, I mean, this is the whole Biden was instrumental in this. The whole expansion, the militarization of police, expansion of the uh, prison system to obscene levels, 25% of the world's prison population in the United States. It all was based on fear, super predators and crack uh, killers. And, you know, it was all fictitious, but it was fear. Uh, and now they're using fear of, uh, of the right wing, fear of Russia, fear of China. They don't, they don't really care. It's, it's never rational. So yes, it, it's, two, it's two issues. It fills that emotional void, us as powerful, great Americans imposing our virtues on uh, others by force. Look, it, it, and, and, and everybody becomes susceptible. I mean, the, I was teaching at Princeton uh, during the calls to invade uh, Afghanistan, and all of those quote-unquote liberal professors were buying this garbage about sending the 101st Airborne to Afghanistan to liberate women. And I kept saying, I, I was the only one who watched these weapon systems. I said, I'm sorry, you know, once you're firing 155 howitzers or using Hellfire missiles, you can't talk to me about human rights. Uh, you're talking about, as we've seen, you know, whole villages or, you know, with uh, helicopters, uh, you know, firing uh, 50 caliber machine guns and munition, you know, slaughtering en masse, but they didn't hear it. I mean, they could not hear it. And I think that that it was, uh, you know, it's not that they weren't stupid. I mean, they're quite well-educated and thoughtful, but they, it, it had that emotional, I mean, at the, at the, uh, when Hitler invaded uh, uh, France and Poland and, you know, started World War II, I think there were something like 40 full professors of history in the German university that all signed a, a letter saying uh, that uh, these other countries were aggressors against Germany. I mean, 
so um, it doesn't matter your educational level. Again, this is, uh, this is an emotional seduction. In some ways, the intellectuals are worse because they're kind of out on the fringes of society and suddenly, like if they're, I mean, uh, Michael Ignatiev, Hitchens, all these people I was battling 20 years ago when we started the war in Iraq, they were certainly bright, uh, capable, thoughtful people, but they, uh, they, they carried the banner for Paul Wolfowitz and all these other trolls that got us into the war. Uh, and, uh, you know, emotional, uh, that emotional susceptibility uh, doesn't exclude the intellectual class. So, uh, yeah, I think it's those two things. It is the emotional seduction, and then it is the very careful orchestration of fear. And most people, you know, Americans don't speak other languages. They uh, they they are uh, not well versed the way Europeans are uh, in other cultures. Uh, and China is uh, very easily caricature, you know, becomes a caricature. It's very easy to turn it into a caricature. I would do the same thing with Russia, of course. Uh, but you know, why is NATO expanded up to the border of uh, Russia? Well, because all of those former and we had, of course, promised. Gorbachev, that we would not extend NATO beyond the borders of Germany. We, we totally, uh, it was total betrayal on the part of the United States. Why? Because it's billions and billions and billions of dollars in arms equipment. I was in Warsaw a while ago. And I got in the airport. There was a giant billboard uh, saying uh, from Raytheon, Raytheon working with the people of Poland or something like this. Uh, so yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's, it's, uh, it's a way to make money. It's these are the merchants of death, and uh, um, and we can't control them. We don't control them anymore, uh, and that that's why it's so dangerous. Well, and and the interesting thing is they're about control, but they can't. That they they think war can control something, which war is the opposite. It's it's full on chaos, and they've failed at that constantly. But they keep in their minds thinking they're going to control something with war, um, and. So, Chris, that was very sad because I'm like, what do what what do you say to an activist that's being targeted by the State Department? The left and the progressives are being targeted by the State Department to be the people that drive us to war with China. They're, yeah, well, they, they, they drove us to war with Iraq, Jody. I mean, you know, the 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 liberals couldn't sign on for the war in Iraq fast enough. Mm -hmm. And so you and I and a few of us were out there, but I was being uh, attacked by name, you know, by George Packer, you know, people like this. Yeah, but those are liberals. I'm talking progressives and left. I'm talking that they are trying to get in, hooked in to, um, to create some form of racism. They're working in black communities. They're working in, in, in uh, Latin communities. China's your enemy. It's taking your jobs. It's, you know, like, no, China did not take your jobs. General Motors took your jobs. But, you know, like, you know, it's just, but it gets in there. It's like, well, they've, you know, they're destroying America because, and, and so it's, it's, it's really like people, it's the, not the people that you would think that would be driving you to war because they're getting in there with stories of human rights abuses and Tibet and, and you know, here's this hook I'm gonna use and you could change, you could save the Tibetan people by like going to war with China, like such an outrageous concept. I don't even know, you know, but that is who's well, being- Well, that, that's classic propaganda. I mean, and it works. Uh, so how do you, you know, protect yourself from propaganda? I guess is the question. Get the hell off of social media. I mean, I'm not on, I have, I am not on social media. I don't have a Facebook. Somebody runs a Twitter account. I think somebody might even run a Facebook account for me. I, I can't see it. I'm not on it. I mean, you, you know, the, the social media is very pernicious. I mean, Noam is right about this. And we have to remain rooted in, I mean, the, the thing about America is that you can find the information in a print, in print, um, but they don't worry about it because no one reads anymore. Uh, so it's there. Uh, and, and, and a social media plays very effectively on those constant dopamine hits. You know, images were very powerful manipulated images. So I would say the first thing is sever yourself as much as possible 
from social media and inform yourself, educate yourself. I actually studied Mandarin. Not, I was the worst Mandarin student. Uh, my Mandarin teacher said that I spoke no tone Mandarin. Mandarin <laughs> has four tones, normally. Um, <laughs> I mean, I tried. Um, I, I was also a problem because my wife is, she's from Canada, but her parents are from Hong Kong because she speaks Cantonese. So I was in a room with someone who spoke fluent Cantonese, somebody who flew, so I, I really, it was humbling, humbling would be, maybe humiliating would be a better word. <laughs> but I did try for several months. Um, uh, you know, you, you must reach out as much as possible. I speak other languages, obviously. It, it's, you know, we must, be, and, and the power, especially for an American of learning to speak another language well, is that when you speak that language, it, you have the ability to step into another culture and look back at your own culture. And that's key in terms of understanding who we are, to be able to see ourselves from the other. I mean, as an Arabic speaker who spent a lot of time in Gaza, I began to be able to see, and I spent six years in Latin America, I began to see who we were as a people. And uh, and unfortunately, that linguistic and cultural illiteracy plays into the hands of the propagandists completely. Um, and in, in, I, I suppose in, in some dark way, they want us to remain that way because mm -hmm. we're more easily manipulated. Well, that's why they destroyed the education system. Yeah, yeah. that's right. So, okay, um, then, you know, we have to do more. I mean, because basically we live in a war economy culture. Yeah. Um, and so we have to divest ourselves because we ourselves are sucking at the tit of the war economy culture and we don't yeah. know it, thinking that it's life when it's destroying everything. So, um, okay, so see fear and, and educate instead and, um, and step outside of the madness of what it is to be um, in the United States of America. That's always double speak, right? Well, and understand that we do have an enemy and it's called the Pentagon. Okay. The, 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 the most uh, destructive force to not only global peace, but American democracy. Leibniz was right about that. Leibniz said that at the, on the eve of World War I. He said, the German military will destroy this country which it did, and the an, an unregulated, uncontrolled, unaccountable military machine of this size will destroy us and, and perhaps even the very planet that gives us life. Wow, thank you. I want to end there because I think, you know, what we're doing at Code Pink is really to remind everyone that war is never the answer. Yeah. And that, you know, last night we were with um, Barbara Lee and Mark Bocan, who've created a congressional committee to work on defunding the Pentagon. And um, we all need to be standing behind that because China's not our enemy and we have to pull the pants down of the Pentagon so people can see it for what it is and how dangerous it is to life on the planet, which is what Chris just said. So Chris, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for all you think about and care about and share and um, for giving us so much to read. Uh, we, we're gonna develop the reading list out of this so we can okay. all- <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you so Thanks, much. <laughs> Thanks for joining us today. Please see all the links in the chat and engage at code pink slash China. Bye, peace, onwards. <laughs>